have two scripture readings tonight. The first one is coming from Genesis 3, verse 19. Genesis 3, verse 19. Give me an amen when you get here so I know we're all on the same verse. Genesis 3, verse 19. Are we there? Amen. amen. Okay. Genesis 3, 19. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now we're going all the way to the end of the Old Testament to Malachi. And it'll be the last uh, verse in Malachi, it'll be Malachi 4, verses 1 through 6. Malachi 4, verses 1 through 6. Malachi 4, 1 through 6. I see your page is turning, so I'm going to give you another minute or so. Are we ready? Amen? Okay, here we go. Malachi 4, verses 1 through 6. For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaffed, and the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch, but for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healings in its wings, and you will go forth and skip like calves from the stall. You will tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under your soles of your feet on the day which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him in Horeb, for all Israel. Behold, I am going to send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the hearts of the children to the fathers, so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Amen. This time, the pastor will come forward and give us the message on the prophetic meaning of dust. Good evening, church. Good, Good to see you in the house of God tonight. I pray that it didn't rain on you too hard, but I pray it rains on you even harder tonight. The blessing that you're in the house of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I wanted to uh, really make this about a 17-page study like the senior pastor did, but I think I'll cut it a little brief from that. But I parallel here, as he did, Genesis 3.19, we know that was a picture of Adam after he had been created from, by God, and God had placed him into a spiritual state or a spiritual place called God's Garden, the Garden of Eden. In Malachi chapter 1, uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 4 there, we see that in the last days the Bible said that the righteous will tread upon the ashes and the dust of the wicked. This is... Uh, was the hope of God for Adam, even in the Garden of Eden. This is the hope of God for you and I in this church in these last days. We need to be able to not be tread upon or trampled by other people, but we need to be able to trample upon the wicked. Hallelujah. Amen. So Genesis chapter 3, verse 19, when you, when you start reading it, unless you wake up, you start thinking literal and you say, Sort of like the Catholic faith, you start saying ashes to ashes and dust to dust. And you, you remember the old army saying that. That from dust you came to dust you shall return. A lot of people say, how do you know, pastor, and how do you know, senior pastor, that when God expelled Adam from the Garden of Eden, that he lost the spirit, that he lost the word. We've learned already that prayer... And the Holy Spirit are literally the breath of the Christian believer. Amen? What, what was the state? Let's go to Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 for just a moment. Very quickly turn there. 
We'll read verses 7 and read verse 8. I know that's a hard book to find. I'll give you a moment here. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. Let's read, okay? Has everyone found it? Shout amen. 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 Okay, let's read it together with one voice. Jesus. Then the Lord God formed a man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils and breath of life, and man became a living being. The Lord gave him his garden and he said, Is there a grace of man? Here the Hebrew word for God made is Yitzur, and it means to, as in to make something, or to try to, quote, remake something in one sense, but just like God's trying to remake us into the image and likeness of God today, right? In Genesis 1, 26 and 27, we see that God created man and woman at the same time in his image and likeness. Yet in Genesis 2, we see that God creates a man first, and it's not until later that he creates the woman. That's kind of true. The woman represents the church. We've learned that in our church, don't we? haven't we? The church is called the mother of all living, just like Sarah would become the mother of all living, just like Eve, Hawa, would become the mother of all living. But this word Yitzhar here means made as if it was a potter forming at the wheel. You know what the name Adam means? It means, the true rendering of that word is Adama, meaning man, red man or man of the clay. Yet the word rendered here is dust. I think dirt without water will always be like dust. I don't think anybody could ever farm anywhere no matter how great the soil is unless there was rain and moisture. Amen? I believe it was true the same, it was the same was true in the Garden of Eden for Adam. I believe it's true for Israel. They needed the early rain, latter rain, and I believe it's true for you and I. We need the literal rains. We need the spiritual rains. We're getting a great rain tonight. I heard everybody keep saying Georgia needed rain. I think we've gotten enough now, don't you? Anyway, what does this mean that God created man? Well, he created him. He created him for a purpose. Hallelujah. What was, God, what was God's purpose for Adam? Remember, where did he come from? What was his original state? He brought him from where? From the dust. Dust. He brought him from the dust. And what did he do to him? He, it says he made the man. Okay? You ever seen the, you ever read, you know what Jeremiah and Isaiah says about, we are the potter and he's the clay. Shall the pot say to the clay, you can't do this to me, do that to me. God can, the potter can do anything he wants to do with us. Amen? So this is a picture of God making Adam. And it was a hard work for God. And we're going to see that it's an even harder work today to create true, true men of God. Adams. Adam, if you want to call it that. Was Adam alive when he was in the dust? Did he have the breath of God when he was dust? See, if you literally think about that God picked dirt up out of the ground out there and packed it together, put a little spit on it and packed him all together, then you'll say, oh, wow, okay, yeah, that's how God made man. It's funny, he can speak and create a star, but he's got to go ahead and get a handful of dirt and spit on it and mix it together to, to make a man. But the Bible says he breathed into his nostrils and he became a living being. In Genesis 3.19, what has Adam just done? Judgment has been passed on Adam. Now, it's not the eternal judgment, but it is judgment. He's broken covenant with God. God is angry at him. And one of the reasons God is angry at him is because he's not repenting. He knows that he should repent, but he hasn't done it. And God is saying, Adam... You know something? You used to be dust. You know something else, Adam? You're dust again. Now, how did Adam become dust? What was his original state before God created him? What does it mean to fall? It means to go from one state to fall back to another state. Psalms 51, 9 through 
12 talks about where David speaks about, you made me a king, please don't take your spirit away from me. Well, Adam was sort of a king and like a priest in the Garden of Eden. He was abiding for God. He was serving God, worshiping God, digging for God, keeping the ground for God, keeping the church for God, keeping the garden for God. Individually, our heart is the garden of God. But spiritually and collectively, the covenant of the church, church can be the garden of God. And Adam is supposed to keep it. But here it's, God says, you're dust, my friend. Now why is God going to tell him that you're dust? Because when that God comes to him in the cool of the day there, just a few verses before this, what does God say? When God says, what have you done? The first thing he starts doing is blaming his wife, blaming the woman. Did Jesus Christ blame the woman? No, he died for the woman. He kept right on working. He fulfilled his role and part in redemption history. How many of you understand we have to fulfill our role and do our part also? Amen? Now I want you to think about this. What does it really mean to be dust? Why did God, what did God mean when he said you're dust and you're ashes? When we die, we become like ashes all again, all over again, don't we? Let's talk about the sacrificial system for just a moment. We know in this church, I believe every one of you know that when I bring a cow up to the offering under the Old Testament or a red heifer or a goat or a bull or anything else, when I bring it up there, that bull didn't do anything wrong. It's me that did something wrong. Amen? So that bull is really me. He's in my stead. That bull is representing me. The same is true with ashes and dust. It represents our sinful state. So I want you to think about this. When God came looking for Adam, what was Adam doing? What was Adam doing? He was hiding. Where was he hiding at? Behind the tree. I wonder what tree it was he was hiding behind. Is it that tree perhaps that he ate fruit from? I don't know. Something to think about, isn't it? Whatever that tree it was, he was hiding behind, or in a bunch of trees, I bet you that tree of the knowledge of good and evil was right in the middle of them, just like the Bible says. <clears throat> when God asked Adam, what have you done, though Adam never repented, he kept making excuses. And so when we don't repent, when God gives us a chance, what happens? We fall. We fall. We fall. Hebrews is very clear. Hebrews chapter 6 warns us in verse 7 and 8. Ground upon which the rain often falls and there is not a fruit for God is in danger of judgment and fire. Malachi chapter 4 speaks about the last day and how God, the great day of the Lord, the day of the sun, a bright day is going to be a day, be a day for burning of the wicked. Now I want you to really think about this as we get into this message because I believe it was profound, it is. When God said, Adam, you're dust. When he said, Adam, you're dust. He had told Adam already, he already warned him, said, Adam, listen to me. The day that you eat of that tree, you're going to die. Well, Adam ate of it and he didn't think he died. Maybe Adam got the thinking and reasoning a little different. Have you ever heard of the easy, broad way and the easy way? Jesus talked about broad is the way and broad is the way that leads us to destruction, but narrow is the way that leads us to eternal life. What, was, what, is, where, what is our destination? What the devil knew, Satan knew that Adam was destined and God was trying to make him into his image and likeness. He was in training. In training camp, disciplining him. Training him up in the word of God. You can eat from all the trees, Adam. But you cannot eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And one day, God tells him, he said, hey, if you eat of that tree, you're going to die. And it's so ironic that Adam would make excuses and he would go and try to hide behind that tree. And then God had to give them animal skins, see? 
Because finally Adam realized that he had to stand before God and he was naked. One day we have to stand before God and we're going to be naked. To be dust is to be naked. Say that with me. To be dust is to be naked. When he was tempted by the serpent, Adam reasoned, and listen to what he, he, he came to believe. Number one, he believed that by eating of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he would learn an easy way to become like God. He thought he'd find an easy way. Let me tell you something. There is no easy way to be like Jesus Christ. There is no easy way to be like our Father. There's no easy way to become like a pastor, like the senior pastor wanted us to be. It was hard. So many people quit. But he thought, if I eat of this tree like the serpent's telling me, oh, there's a secret. Now I can become like God Almighty. That's my destination. That's my goal. That's heaven to be like God. He thought, perhaps... If I eat of this tree, I can bypass a lot of the hardships and tribulations and hard times that I know that God the potter is going to put me through. How many of you know that God is a potter and he's putting every one of us through the furnace of fire? You better believe he is and he's still doing it right now. If you think you're not going to have any more hardships in your life, you're crazy. <laughs> That's true. You're, you're, you're deceiving your own self. The problem is, if you, if you, here's the blessing, if you stay right with God, God will keep you. Amen. Yeah. You'll tread upon the wicked rather than the wicked treading upon you. Adam thought, ah, this is the easy way to possess the image and likeness of God. If I eat this tree... I can be instantly like God. A lot of you, a lot of Christians today, they think, hey, all I gotta do is believe in Jesus and go to church once in a while, and one day they're gonna rapture the church and pew, instantly, and I'm gonna be just like God. You see the deception? Let me tell you something. I'm gonna make a statement. You can write it down, record it, you can say, Pastor John said it. There is no dust in heaven. I'll say it again. There is no dust dust in heaven. Now, what did God do with Adam after he made? He said, you're dust, Adam. What did God do to him? What did God do? Let's read verse 22 through 24 in Genesis 3. <laughs> Genesis 3, 22 through 24. If you find it, say amen. amen. Genesis 3. Let me turn it on and I'll read it with you. Let's see. Verse 22. Let's read there. Begin. And then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now lest he stretch out his hand and eat and take of the tree of life, and eat also and live forever. See, God was going to stop him, wasn't he? See, God will block you and keep you out of the Garden of Eden. If you go around looking for the Eden and the flaming sword, you'll never find it. You have to understand, these are, this is a spiritual and prophetic language. Let's read verse 24. So he drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction, to guard the way to the tree of life. Why? Because Adam was now dust. Matthew 8, 20 says, let the dead bury the dead. That's what Jesus said. I'm going to tell you something. Maybe you've never thought about it before. But when you have received the word of God and you turn away from God, you turn away from the God and you walk away from the word of God, you know what just happened to you? You think you can keep the Holy Spirit? You're grieving the Holy Spirit and you're grieving Emmanuel and you're grieving God. God will take his Holy Spirit away from you. The Bible says don't grieve the Spirit. Adam died and God was going to have to make him alive. What is the status of all the world today without Jesus Christ, church? 
What are, are they alive or dead? I said Sunday, they're like the walking dead. That movie. Everybody's the walking dead. Let's turn to Revelation 3.20. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry, it's not the verse here. Here, the voice, the voice that says you have a reputation that you're alive, but you're dead. He was speaking to the church at Laodicea. Anyway, Revelations three, there in verse, uh, <coughs> excuse me, fifteen or seventeen, and whatever it goes on to say. It says, because you're lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will set, spew you out of my mouth, just like he spews you out of Eden, right? Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have no need of clothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, just like Adam was, right? And verse 18 says, I advise you to buy gold from me, refined by the fire, that you might become rich and white garments, that you would clothe yourself and shame the, cover the shameful nakedness that your nakedness may not be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. Those who I love, I reprove. Be zealous for the Lord and repent. Okay? Gosh, what is that verse? I cannot think of it off the top of my head again. Okay. Anyway. This, oh, I know what it is. Yes, Revelation. I was in the right chapter of all verse. Revelation 3 1. There's where I was trying to go. Okay? Is everybody with me? Amen. Revelation 3 1. Let's read that. She, John. To and to the, the angel of the church in Sardis write, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this I know your deeds, that you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. It says, Wake up and strengthen that which remains. Sometimes Christians need to do that, don't they? Amen. Christians have the name, they're alive. I, do you think we're living in a world where a lot of people are living under the name of Jesus today, and yet they're not really alive at all? You better believe they are. False confessions everywhere. We follow tradition rather than the Word of God. We follow tradition in a pastor rather than we do the Spirit of God. So I want you to think about this as I continue, okay? Adam thought the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was going to make it just an easy way for him. This was a judgment that was not only for Adam, but it was going to be a, that what Adam did brought a curse upon the ground. Now let's contrast the curse on the ground that Adam received. Eden was a blessed land, was it not? And now he's saying, hey, the ground where you're living rather than being blessed now has become cursed. And so we just fast forward that over to Jacob and Esau. Jacob's ground was blessed. It didn't matter where Jacob went from then on. It didn't matter if he went to his Uncle Laban's house. Wherever he went, it was a blessed land. He saw ladders ascend to heaven. Everything that Jacob did was blessed. For Esau, just the opposite. So that's what I'm, I'm trying to contrast here. Adam died, just like God said he did. But you know something? The senior pastor taught us that he repented. When did he repent? When do you think he repented? After he went through so much heartbreak. Remember when Cain killed Abel? 
You think that might have brought about his repentance? Would it bring about your repentance? I pray that it would. God is a God that we need to fear, revere, and believe in. It doesn't matter how much you say you don't believe. It doesn't matter what you say. At the end, you're going you're to receive the recompense of God if you do not repent. How many of you believe we need a good father? Why do we need a good father? Was Adam a good father? Was Adam a good father? No, he wasn't a good father because he turned away from the purpose which, which God called him to do. What would make Pastor John a good father? I believe if I keep the word of God, I am being a witness to my children and to you and to everyone else. I need to stay with God. Amen? That makes me a good father. But look, I'm not calling myself good. But I am going to call someone else good. We've all studied Genesis genealogies, haven't we? You went from Adam to Seth and you go all the way down to Noah. Isn't it ironic as you get closer and closer and closer to the end time in Noah that the fathers get better? Isn't it funny after you go through another ten generations you get closer and closer to Abraham and the fathers get better? How many of you would like to have a father named Abraham? I do. So I want you to pick up on what I'm saying here. Don't let it soar over you like a 747. Okay? We need a good father. And we to have a right father. What is going to make us have a good father? What made Abraham good, church? What makes our father Abraham so good? Because he was unlike, unlike, Abra, unlike Adam. He would not break covenant with God. He would not disobey God. Can I get an amen? amen. Okay. In contrast to Adam, Abraham was a good father. Consider, let's consider how Abraham worked, okay? A good father always intercedes for others. Well, where did, where did Abraham intercede? Do you remember on Genesis 18 where he met the Lord and the two angels? And then he, 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 he prepares a great sacrifice. He sac makes the sacrifice of whatever, and he does all that, I believe, so that he could intercede for Lot <coughs> and his wife down in Sodom and Gomorrah. Why is Sodom and Gomorrah <coughs> and the story of Abraham so important? Because it too is a picture of the last day. God was going to burn Sodom and Gomorrah with sulfur and fire in judgment. And we need a good father interceding for us to get us out of that place. Amen? We need to get out of Sodom and Gomorrah just like Daniel needed to get out of Babylon. Revelation 18 said we have to get out of Babylon in the last days. Why? Because God is going to destroy the harlot in Babylon. Now, Abraham interceded with for Lot and his wife. And he interceded for his family there. But he did it in humility. He was very humble. That's why he was a good father. How many believe that Abraham was a humble man? Look at Genesis 18. <coughs> excuse me. Verses 27 and 28. I'll read that. It says, Genesis 18, 27 and 28 says, Now that I have been, have been so bold as even to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous is five less than fifty? Will you destroy the whole city because of five people? God had told him if there's 50 people there, it won't destroy it, right? So Abraham starts inter interceding with God, take it down to five and try to bring it five more and five more. He keeps interceding. But what, was the, what did Abraham say here? He said, now that I have been so bold, let's read it together. She, John, now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but what? Dust and ashes. What if the number of the righteous is five less than 50? Will you really destroy the city? I believe our Father is interceding for us even right now. If you love the Lord, you have to say amen to that. Okay? I want to ask you a question. 
How could Abraham know? Where did Abraham get this great wisdom that he was nothing but dust and ashes? I'll say it, tell you how he got that word. He got it from God. It was probably also handed down through the Genesis, the Genesis genealogical line down to Abraham. However, Abraham is unique because he had this wonderful relationship with God. Wherever Abraham had a journey, he, he worshipped God. God was with him. Wherever he had to move his tent, God was with him. Wherever he had to move his tent, he'd build an altar and he'd worship God. Do you worship God wherever you go? Then you're, you could possibly be a good dad. The Bible says very clearly, he was a praying man. Wherever Abraham went, he worshiped God. Wherever he journeyed and moved his tent, he worshiped God. He set up the altar and he realized what was he offering, church? He was offering the same thing the Levites did and the priests did later on. He was offering up animals as sacrifice. But oh, one day God said, hey, don't offer up an animal, Abraham, anymore. I want you to give me your son as a burnt offering. If he had burned his son, what would have happened, church? His son would have literally become the epitome of what God says I'm going to do at judgment. What God did at Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham knew God. That's why he could do that. Genesis 18.1 talks about how he met Christ and he ran to him. Bowed down. Genesis 14.18 said he met Melchizedek. The king of Salem. King of peace. Hebrews 7, 1 and 2 tells us who that was. The king of kings and lord of lords. He didn't just meet Melchizedek, he tied to Melchizedek. Abraham knew that fallen man had no right to talk to God. Why? Because they are but dust and ashes. He knew that fallen man had, the, had to make sacrifices to even come before God. He knew that he had to burn sacrifices to even pray to God. He understood this stuff. He knew that something had to happen to make, to please God. Let me tell you something, church. The greatest thing that pleases our Father today is when we live our life as a living sacrifice before God. We're to be a living sacrifice. Like a burnt offering to God. We're all of our old self is burnt up in a brand new John and a brand new whoever is serving God. He knew that he was only dust and that all of his descendants were dust. But look here, Abraham was going to be a good father. He was going to recover from that spiritual state. He left the land of Ur. He went to Haran. But finally he went where? To Canaan land. And it is so amazing that Abraham on his journey had to meet Melchizedek. Isn't that wonderful? So I want you to think about it this morning. As dust, or this evening, dust is man that is under a curse. What is the land that's under a curse? Your heart. Jesus says in Matthew 13, verse 8 and the following, and it goes down and picks back up again in 19 and the following, he talks about how a man, he, he was teaching the word of God. He was teaching and doing all kinds of miracles. And he said, blessed are you because you hear the word of God and you see these things. And then immediately he goes in and gives the parable about the soils. Four kinds of soils. Every one of us in this room have one of those types of soils. None of us had good soil in the beginning. We evolve and change as, we, as God grows us. We gradually change just like that pot we gradually are formed and God handles us and he keeps touching us as, as we're spinning around to make us like he wants us to be that old saying God's not through working on me is true isn't it see Abraham realized that going back to Canaan going back to the promised land is not it's something the father received the promise and his descendants his children we're also going to receive that promise. 
But many of Israel, though they were children of Abraham, they did not have faith like Abraham. And a lot of Christians today, as children of God, they say they believe, love Jesus, but they're not like Jesus at all. We need the image of God. Amen? I want you to think about it. Mankind, all of them were in a fallen state. None of them were in Eden. A man of the dust, the senior pastor says this right out of the Bible. A man of the dust is not alive. When you leave Eden, you're dust. I could put that more specific if you would like. If you come to my office, I'll do that. But a man of the dust does not have the breath of God. That's before. If you're dust, it's, it, you're in a state that was before you received the Holy Spirit. Dust, <laughs> listen carefully, this sounds just like it, okay? I used to see people come to Seoul and they'd bring the senior pastor presents and stuff and he had cameras all in his room. I had a very close relationship with him. And I'd go into his room and I'd see cameras everywhere. And he'd be sitting there if he wasn't reading his Bible. He'd be, with his little towels, he'd be like, he'd wiping down his cameras and stuff. On his desk, there was no dust anywhere. On his cameras, there was no dust. On his floor, there was no dust. On his clothes, there was no dust. He's the one that taught us this lesson. And I said, wow. A man of the dust is not alive because he does not have the breath of God. That's how we know Adam lost the Word and the Holy Spirit. How do you understand the Word of God? What stops you from being wicked today? It is the grace of God in giving you the Holy Spirit. Now look here. <laughs> the senior pastor, if you would bring him in a present, the first thing he'd do He'd wipe that present down too. Pastor Beatty knows what I'm talking about, don't you, brother? He'd wipe that present down. They all, all was like, what the heck? And I don't care who brought that present, he'd wipe it down. Because he was not going to put anything in his house that had dust on it. You know why? Write this one down, number one. Dust is light, it is weightless, it has no weight. You remember Daniel and the king, that old wicked king's son, drinking from the implements and the, the vessels of the temple. And he saw the finger writing on the wall, and he said, you have been found lacking in the scales of God. Dust is light and dust is weightless. And the senior pastor said, watch this. The slightest little dust, wind, the slightest little wind will blow dust around. If you don't have the Word of God, if you're not really alive, are you hearing me, Deacon Cindy? If you're not really alive, the slightest little wind, the slightest little tribulation, the slightest little hardship will make you fall away. You're blown around by every wind of doctrine. He, he, he talked about snakes sometime. He talked about how snakes, you start craw crawling around, you come up to a rock. Old oh, snake is lazy. He might not climb up over that rock. He'll go around it. He's always looking for an easy way. In regards to the work of God, that's what we're talking about tonight, isn't it? In regards to the work of God, and the word abod, it means to serve God and to worship God. The senior pastor said, Dust is useless. Say that with me. Dust is useless. Hey, it's one thing for us to think about dust is useless. It's another thing to say, God, if God says you're useless to him, that's terrible. Amen? You need to be like Jesus, somebody that God can say, in him I am well pleased. Amen. This adds to a new meaning to the word of being alive, doesn't it? It adds new meaning to the word of being resurrected, doesn't it? Because we can literally be resurrected from the grave, but we can spiritually be resurrected from the dead. Matthew chapter 8, verse 20. 
in Revelation 3.1. Now I'm on track here. Look here, guys. Universally, dust is a meaningless and useless part of our world. How many of you just say, you see dust in your house? Sister Baby, when, you're, when, when you, when you uh, go to your house, if you see any dust in your house, do you say, oh boy, I, I just love that dust. Let me go get some more of it. Do you say that? I'm just, <sighs> we don't like dust. God doesn't like dust either. We use, we, we use furniture polish to get dust off of our furniture. When that we get dust off of our windows. Isn't dust just helpful? Even some of you in your closets, like my wife, you, you hate dust so much you'll put plastic sheets across the top of your clothes hanging in the closet so dust won't get on your clothing. But the dust of the world gets all over us every day, doesn't it? You know it does. But God says you've got to shake it off. Amen? Clean it off. Wipe it off. But what do you do about the dust that's on the inside? Chanted us there. What do you do about the dust you have on the inside of your heart? <coughs> that's your true house. We don't like dust. You ever heard the old saying, dust busters? Let me tell you something. The Word of God is the best dust buster you'll ever find. Amen? We cover our clothes to keep our closets free of dust. Keep... We hate dust. Dust is harmful too. Have you ever noticed how healthy, harmful, how dust is? Cindy works at the hospital, right? A lot of people get allergies. What is one of the biggest allergies people have? Dust allergies. It's not only, we only hate it, it makes us <coughs> sneeze. And when we sneeze, we make other people sick. Dust doesn't help God and it doesn't help us. Amen? We do everything we can to keep dust out because we know it's harmful. It causes allergies and it makes other people sick. But you know one thing is, the senior, now this is a senior pastor wrote this. Man, I wish he had wrote this in Calvin's book. He says, dust has no solid form to it. You can't build with it either. You can't do anything with dust but complain about it and try to wipe it away and get it out of your life. Like I said, he used to wipe off all of his cameras and everything. His desk was always spotless. Young knows my desk is always spotless. <laughs> She's laughing at me because she knows it's the, I'm the antithesis of all that, okay? Let me tell you something. What was God teaching Israel in the desert? The desert is a place that's full of dust. All of you guys that's been to Saudi or Iraq and Iran, you know that. Church, dust is God's description of unfaithful people. Dust is the description of fallen people. Dust is the description of those who fall and turn away from the Word of God. Dust represents the wicked, the unbelievers. If you go around and tell people you don't believe in God, does that make God not, does that stop God from existing? God still exists whether you believe in Him or not, doesn't He? The Bible says, I heard a writer say one time it's a dangerous thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. Listen carefully. He said, dust and ashes represent those that are burned up in judgment. Now, I don't want to offend anybody tonight if, if, you, if you've already created your, cremated your loved ones or whatever. But the senior pastor also went through his Bible study and taught this is the reason you don't cremate. Because you're burning up their very bones that God would resurrect. It's a good thing God can correct all that, isn't it? It says, it represents those who are burned up in judgment by fire, just like they were in Sodom and Gomorrah, and just like they will be in Matthew, excuse me, Malachi chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. 
Fallen man, uh, fallen man is nothing but a heap and pile of dust and ashes. Ouch. Fallen man is destined to destruction, hell, and a fire. This is why God uses dust and ashes in all of his ceremonial laws of the Old Testament. You ever heard of the Roman Catholic Church's Ash Wednesday? Beginning of Lent? You think they really got a firm grasp on understanding on dust and ashes? This is why God uses them. Numbers chapter 19 verse 9. And also verse 17. He uses dust and ashes to remind Israelite, just like he reminded Abraham, you are nothing but dust and ashes. Now the Bible says in Hebrews 1, 7 that God is a consuming fire. And his word is a fire. And that he makes his ministers flames of fire. So, which would be better, to be burned up today with the Word of God and made righteous, or to be burned up in the end for eternity in heaven? Give me the Word every time. Amen? Amen. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 26. Let's read that. Jeremiah, Jeremiah 6, verse 26. Jeremiah 6, verse 26. If you have found that, please say amen. Amen. Has everyone found it? I hear pages with me. Jeremiah 6, verse 26. Let's read it. She, huh? Jeremiah told the Israelites, Oh, my people, put on sackcloth and roll in ashes. Mourn with bitter wailing as you would for the death or loss of an only son. For suddenly the destroyer will come upon you. Jeremiah wasn't kidding, was he? God really wanted the Israelites to do something. Hey, let me ask you a question. We all like churches, big churches, right? Air conditioners and nice pews and nice chairs and all this stuff. What about if John Moksani Molu Pamenun? What about if I said, hey, Cindy, hey, Steve, hey, uh, brothers and sisters, I want you to, I'm, I, brought a bucket of, I brought a bucket of ashes in here I want, and dust. I want you just to sprinkle it all over your heads. How many of you would say amen? Amen. Well, Jay, you better be careful. You say amen. <laughs> you don't understand. Could you imagine this evening if I told you to put on sackcloth? You say, why? I, I, ain't nobody dead. Why am I going to Koreans love sackcloth? So do the Jews. How many of you say, Pastor, I don't want to soil my pretty new blouse. Oh, I don't want to soil my pretty new suit. I just took a bath, Mom Sunny. I, don't, I just washed my hair. I just had my hair done, see? You'd make up every excuse in the world, wouldn't you? This is not Pastor John speaking. This is the Word of God speaking. Amen? Amen? You'd probably tell me, I don't want to look like some idiot rolling around in ashes and dust here. But God made Israel do it. Why do you think they loved Jeremiah so much? They hated his guts. And they probably hated, if they hated Jeremiah, hated God. Also, because God won't make them roll around in the ashes. Like I said, what if I passed around a bowl of ashes tonight and I asked you to put some of the ashes on your forehead before you prayed tonight, before you came to worship tonight? To get you right with God, you've got to get in sackcloth and ashes. That would make your prayers be heard. God would say your worship is in spirit and in truth. What, what if I did that? I'm going to tell you like it is, just like he said right here, verbatim. He says, most of you would get mad. Well, he, he also put some other words in there that I'm going to put in there. You'd say, I'm not going to get my hair dirty. I'm not going to mess up my makeup, Pastor. We wouldn't even want to worship. We might want to leave. <laughs> I'm not going to worship in a church like that. <clears throat> Let's be real about Christians today. 
You've heard in the Bible, Paul said in the last days, the people, the churches would hire people. They would become lovers of themselves, hiring teachers that would tickle their ears, say nice things to them, suck up to them. I, don't, I think we do need to be loving churches. We, need, we can have love, but love is teaching the Word of God, isn't it? Amen. Would you rather me kiss your butt or keep you out of the flames of hell? Which one would you rather? Huh? You want me to keep you out of hell, won't you? That's my job. If you had cancer, you want me to say, oh, I feel sorry because you're sick. Or would you want me to go in and cut that cancer out? Get it out. Amen? So... Today's churches, they want padded pews, good heating and air conditioning, beautiful buildings, and they want leaders and pastors that will pamper their people. And you know what? Elders and deacons of the church and the leaders of the church, they say, hey, we we, we got to change pastors because if, if the attendance is going to start dropping off. You know what the senior pastor said about that? Let it fall. Let it fall off. If they can fall, let them fall. I'm going to say it again because time ran out on me and I'm not finished the message and I'll finish it. I will finish this. There is no dust in heaven. There is no dust in the Garden of Eden. There was no dust in the senior pastor's office. And he said there ought not to be dust in the church. So how can we stop dust from being in the church. Why, am I, why in the world are we teaching about this? Because we're getting ready for the new year. Amen? We're going to be passing a river of time called 2016. And we're passing over into 2017. And we're going to clean this church building. We're going to get all the dust off the windows and all this kind of stuff. And we come in and clean the church every Saturday and stuff like this. But what about the inside of the church? What about the inside here? That's what need, really needs to be cleaned. If we clean this one, it's a sign that we know we have to keep this one clean too. Do you want to be a real Christian? Listen carefully. The very idea of me telling you to put ashes on your forehead because God's Word tells you to do that, if you did it, it's a sign that you're being humble. Did you know the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 18, I think it is. I've got the verse here somewhere. It says, pride goeth before the fall and destruction. Satan fell from heaven because of pride. If you're not careful, you can think you found a new tree and a new way. And you think you found an easy way. You may find a new pastor or a new whatever, new church. Where do you think? It's big. The numbers are growing. But that's not what makes a good church. That doesn't make a good garden. What makes a good garden is getting all the weeds out, getting all the dust out, and getting all the unnecessary things out of it. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I want to be ready for the coming of my Father in His glory. God's main point in saving Adam was not just telling him you're saved. When he said you're dust, Adam, he wasn't just saying literally you're going to go back to the dust. That's not what he was saying. Prophetically, God is talking about something far beyond that. What was going to be the serpent's food in the Garden of Eden? Brother Steve, you remember that? What was the serpent's food going to be? Genesis 3 tells us. He said, cursed are you. For the rest of your days, you shall crawl on your belly, and what shall be your food? Dust. If you are dust, you are nothing more than the serpent's food. He can eat you whenever he wants to. He can trample on you anytime he wants to. But you can't do that to the true child of God. Amen. Amen. Adam was now dead. Adam was devoid of the Spirit. And Adam, just like dust, was useless to God. Why was he useless? Because now he couldn't minister the Word of God in Eden anymore. What is the books of redemption history and stuff all about? It's all about us.
proclaiming the word of redemption history and the word of God. Amen? But we have to be useful to God. If you doubt the word of God, if you turn away from the word of God, if you break covenant with God, or as I said Sunday, if you get out of the boat, if Jesus is not in the helm of your boat, guess what? You ought to do some soul searching and say, God, where am I? Because that's what God asked Adam. Where are you, Adam? God was trying to remind Adam. God was reminding Israel, just like Abraham knew. When you stand before me, you're dust because of your sinful attitude. See, it wasn't necessarily what Adam did. Now you've got to grab this. I'm going to finish right here. So listen carefully. See, we think about Adam grabbed some fruit and, nom, 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 and he ate it and suddenly, ping, oh. that's not the way it instantly happens. When Adam ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, his spiritual status changed because of what he ate. Did you understand what I just said? Because of what Adam ate, his spiritual state changed. God didn't have to do anything. When he listened to that other tree, when he listened to the serpent, he automatically began to change in his thinking. Amen? So when you're dialing your radio from now on, be sure you're listening to somebody who's teaching you the Word of God. That's what I'm trying to tell you. When you're listening, you're eating. When you're seeing, you're eating. And whatever goes into these eyes and ears is going directly into your heart. And if you keep on looking, it's going to abide there. In these words, God wanted to remind Adam and Israel that they were, as they stood before him, they were standing there naked because of their sin and their sinful attitudes. Did you know it's our attitude? What causes our attitude? It's because of the way we think. It's the cause of why we reason. Reason means thinking, right? Romans chapter 1, 18 through 25 says that Adam and all of his descendants after him says they exchanged the glory of God for that of four-footed animals. That's why God had them offer four-footed animals on the, on the altar. as a burnt sacrifice. Get them out of your life. And creeping and crawling things. The serpent was a creeping and crawling thing. He crawled on his belly. God says, get them out of your life. But you changed my glory into the glory of a four-footed creature. We think about it, oh, that's what he began to worship. No, that's what he ate. How many of you understand that we need to become food for Jesus Christ? We need to become food for our Father. Our food must be to evangelize. Our food, Jesus said, my food. He had evangelized a woman and he saw the people streaming to him and he said, I have a food you know nothing about. So Jesus was the second Adam and his food was believers. But the first Adam, like the serpent, his food become dust. Let's not exchange the glory of God for corruptible things. Let's receive the word of God tonight and change the glory of the fallen man into the man of God. Don't we want to do that? Is there anybody in here tonight that would say, Pastor John, I just don't want to have the image of God. If you have the image of God, you're going to have that glory of God. Amen. Abraham's a good father, but God, the Father, is greater than Abraham. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. Father God, that through the message of dust and ashes, Father God, we see how that Adam could not stay in the Garden of Eden because of your judgment. 
And Father, we see that Adam changed in his glory, Father, because of the food that he had begun to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Father God, may we repent. May we begin to crave nothing but the living word of God. Father God, may, may we keep working on the ground of our heart. Digging, plowing, working, praying, watering, Father. Sowing, Father. Sowing your word in our hearts until we become strong believers. Father God, let us not be satisfied to bear 30% fruit, Father. Let us not be satisfied with 60, Father. But Father God, may the covenant of the Torch Church become filled with the people who bring a hundredfold into the house of God. Amen. We ask these blessings upon their businesses, upon their homes, upon their hearts, their bodies, their land, Father, their children, their ancestors, Father, their extended families, in this church, this town, this community. Father God, let us be a beacon of light, great light, Father, in this land of darkness. In Jesus' name, we ask this blessing, Father. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Let's turn to hymn number 36. Hymn number 36. <laughs>
Father God, we now present these tithes and offerings to you, Father. Father, we ask that you will look upon them, Father, and see that they're acceptable, Father. And Father, we ask that you multiply them, Father, tenfold, Father, a hundredfold, Father. Let it be used to glorify you, Father. Let it be used to raise up your name in this church, Father. And let it be used as we go out and evangelize your name, Father. Amen. And Father, we just thank you again, Father, for all that you bless this church with, Father. We thank you for blessing us and giving us the means to build this sanctuary, Father, for you, Father, to glorify you. Father, we just say thank you and continue to bless us, Father, as we, we love you, Father, and your word, Father. In your precious name we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This time let's go ahead and rise, let's sing, sing hymn number two. <coughs>